flat line. Movies love this. Whenever there's a flat line, they like shocking it. It's essentially like trying to jumpstart a car with no battery. Hi, my name is Randy Lee. I'm a paramedic here in New York City. I've been doing this for about 11 years, and my role as a paramedic is to provide pre-hospital care to patients. Today, we're gonna to be looking at medical emergencies from movies and TV and judge how realistic they are. Stu. Oh, he's choking. The character is choking on a shrimp, apparently. He never did the universal choking sign. He uh, definitely stopped making any kind of noise, so that's definitely a sign. People who are like, ah, I'm choking, I'm choking, or they say it and they kind of cough, or they're making like this audible noise, uh, and you're like, well, you're not really choking, air's moving. No sound was coming out of his airway, so you can tell that there was no passage of air one way or the other. <laughs> Mrs. Dalfire runs over, begins doing abdominal thrust. In my protocols, that's exactly what you would do. That position is correct. The hand position is just above the umbilicus where your belly button is. I couldn't see perfectly well because obviously Pierce Brosnan's character has clothes on. But if you're right around the belly button, just a little bit higher, that's where you're supposed to be. Then do a J motion upward, which pretty much looked like what Mrs. Doubtfire was doing. Depending what system you work, there are five back blows that are associated with it as well before they do the Heimlich or abdominal thrust. The five back blows is not something we deploy here, uh, not in New York City. And none of it's considerably wrong. It just happens to be what works in your system for what patients you encounter. Lifting, uh, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> Even if the patient was very, very small and you could easily lift somebody up like that, I just don't see where the benefits would be. This is already considered a, a fairly dangerous procedure because you can you know, break ribs. You can, I think there were like some cracking sounds in there, so maybe he broke his back. Abdominal thrust, back slaps is considered a first aid treatment. I think it's a fair enough example, but you're best off to actually take a proper class and not reference something from TV or a movie. I gotta give it a five. I like it. It's Robin Williams. Find her heart. You were shot in the heart, so I guess it's gotta be exact. I don't know exactly where her heart is. I mean, I think it's right here. All right. Come on, man, hurry up. Oh, I know the scene. That's just wrong. Adrenaline is also known as epinephrine. That's not the first line treatment. The medication is fair if the patient was in cardiac arrest. This is a heroin overdose and that's definitely not right. We would give something called Narcan, naloxone. That can actually be delivered three different ways. Uh, from a civilian standpoint, they actually do have these kits. You can give that intranasally, so right through the nose, intramuscularly through the uh, muscle, essentially, like the arm, and then IV. You wouldn't have to necessarily stab it through the chest. All right, tell me what to do. I've never marked anyone's chest with a marker. That's weird, okay. The marking is actually pretty fair in relation to where the heart is. There's this misconception that it's like all the way over to the left. So if you're doing a Pledge of Allegiance, they go this far, like this is where the heart is. It's actually about right here, just slightly over to the left. Ready? One. <gasps> they always like doing this stuff. It's great for film. It looks super dynamic. I can't imagine <laughs> ever taking a medication, just bop, stabbing him in the chest. It's not how it works. A variety of things that can go wrong. When we deliver medication, it's to the bloodstream so it circulates the body. Now, if you just hit the heart, then it disperses in a completely different way and you might miss. I mean, there's, there's bones, there's a sternum in the way, there's floating ribs and ribs in general. There are ways to do something like that where we establish something called intraosseous access in the chest. That's basically drilling a needle into the chest plate, into the sternum specifically and then that gives us access to give medication. To stab it through bone, like that person suggesting, that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> I've never treated anyone that just straight popped up like that. In terms of an epi thing or adrenaline thing, they generally kind of just breathe a little bit faster and uh, their heart rate increases, but with this being that it's a heroin overdose, and then you give Narcan. It's a slow response, and you will have some respiratory responses first, then uh, consciousness should come back if they were knocked out. It's not like drinking 20 energy drinks where you just pop up. I'll give it a two because they said the heart was on the left, and the rest was weird. Resnick and Dr. Farsi, we're trauma surgeons. Show us what you got. You can see the abdominal area is really swollen. I'm thinking there's internal bleeding. The telemedicine part's cool. My system is starting to utilize that kind of thing. It could be something as simple as a cell phone or a tablet. Not a tablet like hers, that was really fancy. All systems currently have a system by which you can communicate with a doctor. However, the doctor's usually specifically on call for that. They wouldn't necessarily be on the golf course. 
oh, look, trauma's coming in. No, they have to be dedicated for that specific thing. I'm going for the skin. Okay, I'm cutting. What? I'm cutting she uses shears like these. We use this specifically to cut clothes. Uh, at no point have I ever used this to cut a body part or skin. Also, it's actually ill-advised to ever cut off any kind of flap of skin. Let's suppose maybe there was an amputation. At no point are you supposed to cut that off to like get it out of the way. I need you to blunt dissect with your hand, right? Mm-mm, mm-mm, negative. No, no, we don't do surgeries and moving ambulances or not moving ambulances as well. It's not a sterile space. It's probably pretty dirty, honestly. If you're gonna be opening up somebody, if you're not treating with antibiotics, you might save them for the moment, but then they'll die of an infection. But we, we will take care of gunshot victims and Depending on your system, the rules change slightly differently. In my system currently, uh, we administer a medication called TXA, transexemic acid, that basically forces blood to coagulate, so it can kind of hinder the bleeding process. But there's not really much we can do outside of that. What our main job is to get them to the hospital where they can actually do this safely. Just slow down, man. We're like, we're playing live operation back here. Just slow down. Sure, that's, that's a problem. There was always this, like, this old trope for EMS, you know, doing the same thing the hospital does, but at 60 miles an hour. And that's true, we do do that sometimes. We're always taught to drive with something called due regard. We are allowed to speed a little bit, we're allowed to like, go past red lights, but you have to do it in a really, really smart way. You have to be safe about it. I've just straight up yelled at the driver, stop, count to 10, then go again. For those 10 seconds, I have some time to you know, do my IVs and whatever I need to do. I give them points for having telemedicine, Two. I am so sorry. Yeah, that's called murder. He stabbed her. No paramedic out there is gonna stab someone. I'm assuming it was something like a tension pneumothorax where they had to release the air. That basically just means that you have air trapping in your lungs and it's expanding, expanding, expanding. And this is the one time you'll ever hear about a paramedic stabbing someone in the chest, essentially. But it's with a really specific tool. If you're using something like this, it's a decompression needle. So that's the needle that you would utilize. So you would find your landmark. There are essentially two locations. One's like down the mid-clavicular line, so mid-clavicle. And there's another spot down the mid-axillary line, so on the side over here. At that point, you would then remove the needle itself, and then this plastic piece would stay there. That's how you release the air from the lungs. Using a knife to do it doesn't work because you're essentially gonna be cutting the lung. The lung won't have the ability to reinflate again. Why is she making that noise? In terms of the wheezing, I'm pretty sure that's just done for TV uh, to make it sound like there's some kind of breathing issue. Wheezing itself is usually associated with something like asthma or anaphylaxis, like an allergic reaction. It's just not the symptom or sign that will come along with the tension pneumothorax. If you were listening to lung sounds for someone with the tension pneumo, you would notice that there's diminished lung sounds on the affected side. What kind of needle is that? Looks like a bone. It doesn't look like the needle was clean. So this is an actual IV catheter. It's in a sealed bag. So this is clean. I can open this right now and use it on a patient. There's also something we apply, some people call it a tourniquet, we call it a venous constricting band. It'll allow your veins to kind of pop up a little bit more so you can make sure you actually hit the vein because that's specifically where you're doing IVs. He took a needle that kind of looked like a bone and proceeded to poke himself and then proceeded to poke Charlize Theron's character. I personally, as a paramedic here in New York, do not do blood transfusions in the field. I gotta give it like a one. As paramedics, we don't hurt our patients. So the fact that he stabbed her, you get sent straight to the bottom. What happened? Stabbed. Cardiac tamponade. Hey, Marvel stuff. Dr. Strange walks in and he says, I'm cardiac tamponade. Uh, basically that means you have blood surrounding the heart. It's restricting the heart from actually pumping. How he knows that is beyond me. Quite honestly, this is one of those situations where we really can't do that much. The big benefit of us showing up would be through our assessments, figure out what it is, then we have the ability to go to the hospital, give the notification early, and hopefully that means they don't have to spend extra time reassessing the patient again. Chest cavity's clear. Oh, percussion. Okay, cool. So percussing is an actual way to do an assessment. We're trained in it to a certain degree, but it's not the most effective thing in my experience. Basically, you're checking for like hyper resonance or basically just the way it sounds. If you thump somebody in the chest, 
uh, and there's fluid, then it would be a lot more solid sounding. Hyper resonance would mean that it's hollow and it sounds a little bit different. Because I would probably just take my stethoscope and listen in and listen to see if the, um, the heartbeat sounds are a little more muffled versus not. She is performing a pericardiosynthesis. She did the right procedure, taking the needle, putting it through essentially the chest to get to the heart to drain out the fluid. I don't personally know how to do that because that's out of my scope of practice. I just know what it is. I would imagine though, you would normally use some way of scanning, maybe an ultrasound so you could see where the layer of the heart is versus the, the little membrane on the outside and where the blood might have been accumulating. But this is why it's a doctoral procedure, not a paramedic procedure. While we do have ultrasounds on the ambulance, depending where you work, in our space, it's just too dangerous. Things move. Oh yeah, 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 flatline, good. Let's shock this, this is not a thing. Flatline, movies love this. Whenever there's a flatline, they like shocking it. The whole point of defibrillation, shocking a person, is to stop VTAC or VFib, where the, the electrical conductivity of the heart, it's, it's going all over the place. So you defibrillate it to allow the heart's automaticity to take over to basically reset it back into a regular rhythm. When there is no rhythm, there's nothing to shock. It's essentially like trying to jumpstart a car with no battery. Also the paddles, great for TV, super cool looking. I, I'm sure there are still hospitals out there that have them, but it's not great for us as pre-hospital care providers because there was a very specific way you had to do it. You had to put the gel on, you had to put it on the chest, you had to do like 15 pounds of pressure to make sure it was even and then poof, shock them. We have the, the actual electrodes that just go on there. They're safer, more efficient. I don't want to give everything twos, but I got to give it a two. I got to do it. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. The bike's crushing the guy, but I didn't think I should move him. You tell me. I personally have gone to motorcycle accidents where very similar to this have happened. PD does show up first sometimes. In this kind of situation, I'm pretty sure they would have done the same thing this police officer did. They would have held off because it's considered a procedure. You don't know what's happening underneath because what if maybe this motorcycle is sitting on top of an injury and restricting it from bleeding more? So they know we're coming and then we'll just take care of it. On three, one, two, three. In terms of removing it, uh, the motorcycle, it seemed fair. When they removed it, they noticed there were other injuries and obviously that's why you remove the motorcycle to, to basically give you access to the patient to do assessments. It's the only thing that's a little bit sketchy is the fact that they removed it from the patient, they went over his head. You wouldn't do that. You would probably go towards the feet or away just because there have been situations where vehicles and things had to be elevated so we can remove the patient out. And unfortunately, there have been times when that elevation process failed and it went right back down. You would generally try to avoid any kind of area like the face, the head, uh, just in case there is a mishap. Ah. Popping on the tourniquet, okay. Tourniquets are utilized to basically stop any kind of arterial bleed, big bleeds. They didn't look like an arterial bleed to me. He could have been staging, uh, meaning you put the tourniquet in the right place but not tighten it all the way, uh, just in case something happens down the line. But yeah, that, that was okay. It looks like the leg that was tourniqueted was also broken. Must have been visually broken for them to automatically start putting a splint on it. So that's fair treatment. Can you get in there? See, shears being used for shear purposes. Oh my God, you're not holding stabilization. You're killing me. That's weird, but not terrible. Removing of the helmet, that was good. Techniques change from person to person and how they like to do it. But I think that that was overall pretty fair. They kind of flubbed a little bit in terms of holding the C-spine, holding the neck, so it didn't kind of jostle. They were doing like holding from the back of the head to not twist left or right, basically hold it in place like that. Normally, like when I do it, I hold the side of the head, like ear to ear kind of area, and hold it like that. But that could just be positioning where they were. That's essentially a little bit forgivable. Chris. Don't move. It's okay. Chris. They did put on the C-spine collar, the cervical spine collar correctly. It was a fair height. You generally want it where not that the head's too high up and not that they have this ability to look down and kind of like swish their head around. Because if there are spinal injuries, you don't want them twisting around and causing more damage. That's something I would do, 100%. Little flubs here and there, but the truth of the matter is when we're working in these environments and doing these kind of scenes, stuff may not go perfectly every time. It's a nine, it's an easy nine. Breathe. I think that the patient's in cardiac arrest, so you would continually do CPR, but that technique is terrible. His CPR was super inconsistent. Um, 
he did five, then he stopped, and maybe he did a couple more, then he stopped. There's this threshold of compressions you have to maintain. You're squishing, essentially, the heart to pump blood through it. You're supposed to do it about 100 beats per minute. The Abyss was made back in the 80s, so protocol for CPR ratios have changed since then. How we practice it now, you're supposed to do 30 compressions on an adult patient in cardiac arrest, and then you can have that little threshold where you can stop to give ventilations. So that's, that's questionable. I just don't see the point of doing something like that. Using a bag valve mask is always going to be better than going mouth to mouth, which will allow for more oxygen to be delivered versus mouth to mouth. Ambient air has 21% oxygen. You exhale out 16% oxygen. And then with the BVM, the bag valve mask, you can actually connect it to oxygen and then deliver nearly 100% oxygen to the patient. But if you're a lay person and you're trying to do CPR on someone, then hands-only CPR is a thing. Now, other systems, they may not do that. Maybe they still encourage mouth to mouth, but according to the American Heart Association, we do hands-only CPR. There's enough oxygen in the blood to circulate to buy you some time for advanced life care support. Come on, baby. Clear. Come on, baby. Clear. You would definitely do the defibrillation, but I don't know how they're looking at the heart. There's no electrodes on her. They're not representing any kind of EKG that obviously reads electrical data of your heart. So could have been another flatliner who got shocked, maybe. Oh my God, you just slapped her. I've never just straight slapped somebody and had them wake up uh, from a cardiac arrest. If you take it from the value of what they're doing and not how they're doing it, not the worst. I'm gonna give it a three. LAFD, open up please. This is not okay! Oh, it's a Smurf. I've seen people that kind of blue too, but usually it's more like the tips of their fingers or lips. Um, around the eyes and the face because you have a little bit of cyanosis, less oxygen perfusion. You just don't have enough oxygen going through your body, so you look blue. And have you taken any colloidal silver supplements? Uh, no. So they first asked about colloidal silvers. So there are these kind of like holistic uh, medications where they actually literally have flakes of silver in liquid, but it can negatively affect you and give you this blue skin tone. And I think it's argyria, that's the effect. That's why you saw them initially asking, are you taking this silver supplement? Because they're worried about argyria. Any medications we should know about? Benzocaine, toothache gel. She's the whole thing. She's seizing. Could be hemoglobinemia. To assess a patient so quickly, um, they did a really great job. So whenever we do scenarios in EMS school, paramedic school, we use scenarios where it's like, okay, you associate one thing with another. That's how you do your assessment so fast. When the paramedic comes out with the benzocaine, benzocaine is a medication to kind of help alleviate pain uh, from a toothache, essentially. Automatically, any paramedic who knows about um, this disease process, a very large amount of like benzocaine, uh, you pot potentially put yourself in something called methoglobinemia. Basically, there's this other binding agent on top of your red blood cells that inhibits it from carrying oxygen anymore. In terms of having a seizure with methemoglobinemia, then that, that's totally valid. That can totally happen. I think it's exactly what I would have done. A patient's seizing and they're sitting in a chair, put them to the floor because you don't want them to flop and then hit the floor. It could hurt themselves. I'll grab the metylene blue chloride. The benzocaine. Overuse can prevent the body from releasing red blood cells. They deployed, uh, administered methylene blue, which is a real medication. You deliver it just for this purpose. It basically turns the blood more receptive to oxygen. I think it was actually really good. I like that they explored multiple options before they got to what it was. I'll give that a solid nine. My favorite medical emergency TV show uh, was a show that was short-lived called Sirens. It was hysterical. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, why not click on the video above?